Okay, hello. I'd like to introduce Christoph from uh, KDAB. He's going to be talking about how to build HMIs and the do's and don'ts, but uh, I think he's going to talk more about the don'ts. So uh, I'm looking forward to a really interesting talk. Thank you, Christoph. Yeah, thanks for introducing me. Um, I'm from KDAB. Uh, this talk will be about three major points. First thing is, what's the difference between embedded programming and automotive programming? So. How do we fail differently in these situations where we have an automotive context? Second point, first know the rules, then break them. But first know the rules. And the third one is uh, these turnkey programming setups and fast turnaround times. These are the things that win your game. Here's where you can shine and win the game in the automotive context. So why am I giving this talk? Well, I'm working at KDAP for some years now on automotive projects, and I've seen different kinds of uh, approaches to architectures, and here's just what I think about architectures uh, in the automotive context. Okay, so what's the difference with automotive um, compared to embedded? Is embedded the same as automotive? Is it not? Well, compared to desktop, embedded means a little bit more work for you as developers, right? You have platform building, you have cross compilation, you have these like hardware limitations of your uh, devices that are actually a little bit slower than your desktop computer and now that you put your uh, software there, it's suddenly slow. And then you have the maybes. Sometimes you have to interact with custom hardware, you have um, CNC machines that are attached to your embedded hardware. Sometimes you need fast startup times for your camera to instantly shoot the next photo. You have multimedia phone integration. For medical devices, you have real time and certification. And for automotive, you have kind of all of this. Like all of these maybes become a definitely. And definitely and um, extra to this, uh, there's also external applications. Like um, external applications coming from other vendors to your application, compositing. You have hands free interaction that are now in the car. You have a changing environment, driving the car from Alaska to um, Arizona. But what's really different here is the size of the project. You have significantly more screens, more settings to handle, larger team, and more parties to integrate into your process. So be aware of that increased size and complexity. There's two things that is really a problem here with this complexity. There's the cross-cutting concerns that go over all the modules that you're now having, these gazillions of screens that you're having for your automotive um, software there. Um, that can be styling, that can be user and role management, or it can be something that is, uh, needs to be reachable from everywhere, like searching. You want to go to that place in an instance. And then you have the interaction between the parts, um, uh, such as data transfers, uh, notifications. Bad thing is, these things only show up at the end of the project. Then this is when you have all the complexity accumulating and this is where you have that exponential uh, increase in complexity because everything needs to interact with everything else. Okay. These may, might be contracting forces that um, aim for a, a monolithic architecture for your overall software, but actually you have lots of teams and need to spread it over many com uh, companies and parties. So just let me give a word on styling. Think twice if you want to include styling into your framework. I know that, and, and with styling, I mean theming in these uh, cases. Yeah? Um, sometimes you can like, have nice animations and changing views of your uh, application done in QML, but that's not styling. What I mean is more theming, like exchanging the look and feel of your application. And this is actually something that is a lot of times um, aimed for and in the end is dropped because it's actually something uh, that cannot be upheld because it's that big of complexity that spreads over your whole application. So think again if you want to have styling. Okay. On another point in styling, I often see these engineering styles here. Uh, something like, okay, I put a rectangle around everything and I put a rectangle around my anchors and then I put a lot of text inside and want to see what my properties are of my elements. Please don't do that. It's very tempting to do that. 
into all components. But this is also a cross-cutting concern that actually kills your performance in the end. Use Gamma Ray, the tool you will find, uh, find in our um, booth there. You can inspect everything, like in the Chrome browser, you inspect your website. Um, use Gamma Ray, um, it is free and you can just uh, download it from GitHub. Okay. Then you have different functionality. Sometimes you want to make that decision, do I do A or do I do B? So what you do in this context is don't change your QML, but change your data origins, change your models that are behind that. And then you can go ahead and filter. Think of all the stakeholders. Manufacturers want the manufacturing view. Retailers want the retailing view, maybe a demo mode. Technicians need something to see the specifics of the car. These all can be um, done with models and filters and then just show up in the points in the QML UI. Okay. About the hardware. Your hardware will be slow, but your hardware will be differently slow than you expected. You expect it to be something like the CPU is just uh, 600 megahertz or just a gigahertz instead of my three gigahertz that I have on my uh, PC um, here where I'm developing. But there's other stuff that is actually way more uh, intense there, which is the I.O. and memory footprint. Oftentimes, these are your key pay, uh, pain points that you have. The HMI startup, there it shows up most times. It's uh, limited by I.O. Screen and view changes, uh, background processes suddenly making your uh, UI slow. And my statement here, and you might disagree, is that there's no inherent algorithmic complexity in car HMI. It's just the memory footprint that kills you and the performance in the end uh, when you come to the end of that project. Okay. So one thing to really uh, look at is to follow the path of memory. I just took the example of, a, um, of, a, of an image. Uh, the image comes from the designer and goes to the screen in the end. So here are the questions that you can ask yourself uh, when I'm going from the designer. Is that thing actually an image? Can, uh, do I need to create it from a designer? Uh, what is my file system block size? Do I need compression? Do I have, uh, can I preload some with VM touch? Preload some of the images during the boot up? Um, when going from memory to texture, so my driver, uh, is it zero copy? Uh, what is about my driver? Do I have different versions? What are the options? And then in the end, is it fully shown? Is it even an effect just applied on that? Maybe a blurring effect or something like that? Um, or how do I interpolate uh, my images? So these, like, have in mind when uh, designing these um, SDKs that you're going from the, from the start to the end uh, and see all these questions and answer them for yourself and answer them for your hardware. Okay. HMIs um, also have multiple applications nowadays. And there we come to compositing. So sometimes you're not going to implement all the navigations for yourself because you have no idea what navigation means in uh, Asia, for example. So you have the subcontractors or you even have third party uh, companies that are giving you these applications and you need to somehow integrate them. And my advice here is if you're Linux, best use Wayland. Otherwise you can try to stream, uh, stream it using GPU extensions, EGL stream and so on. But um, yeah, if in Linux, use Wayland here. Okay, we have seen there's multiple screens in a car. You have the main touch screen, you have the instrument cluster where your meters are, you have your backseat entertainment, and here you have to make the decision on how to structure these multiple views um, over your software. Do you have multiple views in this uh, monolithic um, process, or do you have multiple processes even that interact with each other, are composited together? Do you have multiple operating system instances? For example, for certification, you have a QNX or something that is real-time or real-time Linux, and you have maybe an Android for the, um, I don't know, for the entertainment in the backseat. Or do you even have multiple hardware systems that need to talk to each other over network um, as to have global animations and stuff like that? Okay, uh, cars are also uh, multi-input method um, applications. So you don't only have touch interaction. You also have your physical input method, maybe at your steering wheel, maybe you have voice input. And there you 
cannot just go with QML and with transitions between QML uh, because it only has support for the stack views and um, focus handling, but not really for screen changing and steering of your overall application. Okay, put that to the C++ side. In Auto and Embedded, you own and know the system. That means you do more than just queue it and choose your queued version. You, the backend is actually formable. You can go to your backend guys and say, uh, I need that event, but I need that event not a thousand times a second, I just need it one time a second. So go there and try to negotiate what you get out of your backend. You can slim out your operating systems to have the startup being really fast. You can see the, uh, for the Qt company, there's a nice demo for a really uh, fast starting system there. For Linux, again, there might be the option that you use systemd to organize all your services that you have there in order to um, have a graph and have all the dependencies sorted out for you. Okay, now to the second part. First, know the rules, then break them. But first, know the rules. Structure your C++ around the data from your backend, and the QML um, does your visuals. So the visual structure is done in QML. The logical transitions um, are coming from the C++, and this is where your models and constants are from, and these are then transferred up to the QML uh, as, to, uh, as to display all that information for the users. Please go ahead, reinvent the wheel after you've tried Qt wheels, and Qt has many wheels. So you can see there is lots of stuff you can do with Qt, but if you need to, you can write your own software too. Um, here's something that I take really personal. Please don't create what you won't show on your screen. Everything that takes less than 16 milliseconds, so it's 60 frames, that can be put behind a QML loader. Yeah? You can show that on demand. You click on that button, okay, you load the next screen, you can show the next screen. And with pre-compiled QMLC, it might be tempting to say, okay, QMLC makes everything so much faster, I get so much faster boot up times now, but we've measured it and it's maybe 50%, sometimes 70%, but it's still not free. You still need to load that. And um, this will cost you. So this may also trigger other code from C++ and what's really hard for that is that startup phase that you wanted to make faster initially actually becomes less deterministic and less analyzable because you now have everything that now goes in random order and you don't have the way just a path to your first screen. Okay. But you can also break that rule. You can still load some things up front, some things that you usually reach within one click every time. Uh, this might be the slide outs that you have here. That might be no a general notification center where you just exchange um, the message and then make it visual. Or uh, these are the virtual keyboards, or if you're in a, like a wizard-like application, um, the next screen. You know the thing that the user sees next will be the next screen, so you can preload that. But please do not preload everything. Okay. There's a lot you can take from Qt, but there's also a lot that you can make on your own to make it a little bit faster. So from my experience, the QML shader effects are sometimes slow when you have embedded hardware. They were designed to have like a, a nice design experience there. They're actually optimized, but especially when you're trying to cascade shaders to reach some goal to, to display something in a, in a certain way, um, think twice and maybe um, build it again. Build something that is just one shader uh, and build it into one uh, effect that's your own. Uh, the same goes with particle effects, and depending on your hardware, there might be a trade-off between pre-rendered images or even image sequences that you have uh, uh, compared to effects and um, um, effects or animations that you have. Sometimes an animation is just too complex if you have a, a low-end GPU, but a good I/O system, then you might want to have these pre-baked image sequences to do your animations. You can have a stable Qt version, you can have a new Qt version, but usually your boss tells you to have a stable Qt version. So it's long-term support, it's well-tested, and there's a lot of long-term support versions coming up, like at least like every two years or so for Qt. So if the new long-term uh, support version comes, 
please ask your boss to switch. You will have improved performance. Actually, um, porting everything uh, might be a little bit um, more easy because it's just uh, a few changes you need to do there from like minor versions or like even major versions. Like 4 to 5 is a big change, but 5, uh, but 5 to 3 uh, or 5 to 6 to 5 to 8 or so, that's absolutely doable. And um, you can even go um, and try out an experiment. I've seen projects where they use open source GPU drivers instead of the vendor's GPU drivers, and they're still good and they release their product. So try and uh, find out what's new and if it's worth it. Okay. Not everything will be cute, right? So you will have your data flowing from your backend, from your canvas, slips and drivers, maybe through protocol buffers. <coughs> And at all these points, uh, the data needs to be reevaluated. Re maybe it's a polling. Maybe there's type conversions and checks. And there's that new thing uh, called Qt IVI, uh, which enables you to at least have the Qt world uh, in kind of a unified um, API for all your uh, values that you have there. You have rich types there. That means you have value ranges. You have defaults for values, which make it easy to mock um, your backend when you don't have a uh, backend available yet, or to mock something that is really hard to simulate. For example, there was a crash and the airbag went off. You cannot check that every day. But here you can override these values, these uh, properties, and check how your application reacts to certain property changes. Okay, third point, last point. Fast turnaround times and turnkey programming setups win the game. You want to have your tools ready at what I call the fan out. You've seen there's many parties included in uh, uh, application development when it comes to automotive software. First, you have your planning team planning years ahead. Then you have your core teams um, developing your SDKs. And in the end, you have uh, your outsources and all the development teams bringing into the uh, project. And this is where you want to have your SDK ready. Your build tool, deploy tool, and run tool should be this, and not more than this. Otherwise, you will spend every second waited 100 times over your whole development crew. Okay. So what does a typical 2017, 2018 automotive SDK look like? You have C++ and Qt on the one hand with a custom Qt creator with Qt Automotive Suite. You have static checkers. You have Volgrind to check your code. You have the Qt emulator. I'm talking about this in a second. And you have Gamma Ray to inspect your application as to not write all these debugging uh, output that I've talked before. So uh, on the Linux uh, world, you, if you have Linux, uh, then it's probably yuck to build. You build it on your own. So you have a dev version, a trace version and a product version. Development version has all the tools that your developers will need, like profiling tools like perf and so on. Trace version is a kernel that is instrumented as um, such that you can see what's going on in that kernel. Linux tracing tools, next generation, is a good tool to have here. And then you have your product version, which is slimmed down to what you have, uh, usually also fitting into your memory, which is oftentimes limited. And uh, for the CI, you probably have Git and a gazillion submodules, just seen it that way. Um, Squish CI and may, uh, for a GUI testing and a regular CI for um, just unit testing. Okay, you have no hardware. It's no problem with Qt Automotive Suite. We have an emulator right now. And this is, um, this is where you can have um, uh, a virtual machine running your application and um, on, on the target hardware, which is emulated, uh, and you even have like a software version of hardware buttons around that. So you can try that out. What happens if I had that, uh, hit that hardware button, which is in software, in the emulator? So it's often times I saw that like half of the team or even just a quarter of the team had actual prototypes for their development. With this, Everyone can have that at least on their desktops and try out a little bit more uh, realistically how the software um, performs. And Qt Automotive Suite also comes with, I, I would say, more than 10 ready to run images for the usual boards, like for Raspberry Pi or something, just to try out your applications there. Okay. Last thing, 
actually goes without saying, but I say it again, have fast development cycles. Every second waited is worth eliminating there. If you have a bug and a programmer is sitting on that bug for days and days, he needs to uh, fire up that application hundreds of times. So see that you have differential updates when he, is putting the, he or she is putting the code there. Um, maybe have instant navigations to the problem screen. So when you start up the application, you can directly go to that screen and see that screen where the bug is actually happening and write, see whether it's fixed now or not. And also, if there's lots of delay in between, it hinders the willingness of the developers that just get frustrated to try out something new. If it just takes some seconds and pressing that green button, then I'm willing to try something else or uh, willing to try that other fix that I have in the back of my mind. Okay. It's also true for device flashing. Try to be uh, fast with your flashing and have um, hardware images ready for your whole team at least the next day. Please have a fixed naming scheme for that. Have something like a, a sheet or a form they can fill out and say, uh, okay, I want the Linux in this version, let's say Linux here, uh, backend in this version, queued with these patches, and our software in this version, and I want that image by tomorrow. Because they need to try out something new every day. And I think with um, um, tools like Yocto, it's even possible to do that in a semi-automatic fashion. So you can actually have all that changes at least by the next day to try out everything uh, new. Just let your um, developers explore whether it's faster to have a new Linux version, to try out the new version of the backend that is just coming from the suppliers, or have the new patches in Qt that make it even more performant, for example. Okay, last point on my slide. Please don't invent your own build system. Use something that is already existing. I know that's a great thing to want, but in the end, I often saw that there were gazillions of scripts um, that are plugged into each other and uh, kind of make the build system of your software or the cross-compile system. Use something that is widely used in cross-platform like Yocto, CMake and so on, uh, stuff that people can actually understand and maybe also have experience with. So these were the three points. What is the difference? Difference is project is just huge and you have extra problems with huge pro uh, um, projects. First, know the rules. That's a lot that Qt can offer to you, but then break them if you find out that's actually slow and you want to do stuff uh, that you can do with Qt in five steps, but you build it the custom way, make it in one step. And the third one, turnkey programming setups and fast turnaround times win the game when it comes to automotive development. Thank you. And if there's question, I think we have time for discussion.